Hello, my friends. Welcome back to The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Let's quickly talk about, we read the end of chapter 11 yesterday. Let's quickly talk about what happened. Who can tell me what happened at the end of the last chapter that made the witch so angry? And I'll give you a hint. What was happening? The snow was melting. Was it winter anymore? No. Spring was coming, and at the very end of the chapter, what did the dwarf say? He said, who must have caused winter to end and spring to come? Aslan, that's right. And the witch got so angry, and she said, if either of you mentions that name again, I will kill you. So our next chapter, chapter 12, is called Peter's First Battle. While the dwarf and the white witch were saying this, Miles away, the beavers and the children were walking on, hour after hour, into what seemed a delicious dream. Long ago, they had left the coats behind them, and by now they had even stopped saying to one another, look, there's a kingfisher, or I say bluebells, or what was that lovely smell, or just listen to that thrush. They walked on in silence, drinking it all in, passing through patches of warm sunlight into cool green thickets and out again into wide mossy glades where tall elms raised the leaky roof far overhead and then into dense masses of flowering current and among hawthorn bushes where the sweet smell was almost overpowering. They had been just as surprised as Edmund when they saw the winter vanishing and the whole wood passing in a few hours or so from January to May. They hadn't even known for certain, as the witch did, that this was what would happen when Aslan came to Narnia. But they all knew that it was her spells which had produced the endless winter, and therefore they all knew when this magic spring began that something had gone wrong and badly wrong with the witch's schemes. And after the thaw had been going on for some time, they all realized that the witch would no longer be able to use her sleigh. After that, they didn't hurry so much and they allowed themselves more rests and longer ones. They were pretty tired by now, of course, but not what I'd call bitterly tired. Only slow and feeling very dreamy and quiet inside as one does when one is coming to the end of a long day in the open. Susan had a slight blister on one heel. They had left the course of the big river some time ago, for one had to turn a little to the right, that meant a little to the south, to reach the place of the stone table. Even if this had not been their way, they couldn't have kept to the river valley once the thaw began, for with all that melting snow, the river was soon in flood, a wonderful, roaring, thundering yellow flood, and their path would have been underwater. And now the sun got low and the light got redder and the shadows got longer and the flowers began to think about closing. Not long now, said Mr. Beaver and began leading them uphill across some very deep springy moss. It felt nice under their tired feet in a place where only tall trees grew very wide apart. The climb coming at the end of the long day made them all pant. And just as Lucy was wondering whether she could really get to the top without another long rest, Suddenly, they were at the top, and this is what they saw. They were on a green open space from which you could look down on the forest, spreading as far as one could see in every direction, except right ahead. There, far to the east, was something twinkling and moving. By gum, whispered Peter to Susan, the sea. In the very middle of this open hilltop was the stone table. It was a great grim slab of gray stone supported on four upright stones. It looked very old and it was cut all over with strange lines and figures that might be the letters of an unknown language. They gave you a curious feeling when you looked at them. The next thing they saw was a pavilion pitched on one side of the open place. A wonderful pavilion it was and especially now when the light of the setting sun fell upon it with sides of what looked like yellow silk and cords of crimson and tent pegs of ivory, and high above it on a pole, a banner which bore a red rampant lion fluttering in the breeze which was blowing in their faces from the far off sea. While they were looking at this, they heard a sound of music on their right, and turning in that direction, they saw what they had come to see. 
Aslan stood in the center of a crowd of creatures who had grouped themselves round him in the shape of a half moon. There were tree women there and well women, dryads and naiads as they used to be called in our world, who had stringed instruments. It was that they, it was they who had made the music. There were four great centaurs. The horse part of them was like huge English farm horses, and the man part was like stern but beautiful giants. There was also a unicorn, and a bull with the head of a man, and a pelican, and an eagle, and a great dog. And next to Aslan stood two leopards, of whom one carried his crown, and the other his standard. I'm gonna show you a picture. Do you see Aslan in the middle of that great group? Yes. So he's surrounded by all of the creatures of Narnia, centaurs and a unicorn. Do you see, oh, I think I see the unicorn. Oh, way up there at the top. Do you see the point on that unicorn's head? Right there, the white unicorn. That's right. And tree women and well women and all kinds of different creatures. Do you think these creatures are good creatures or bad? I think they're good. They're there to help Aslan and the children. Okay, we'll read just a little bit more for today. But as for Aslan himself, the beavers and the children didn't know what to do or say when they saw him. People who have not been in Narnia sometimes think that a thing cannot be good and terrible at the same time. If the children had ever thought so, they were cured of it now. For when they tried to look at Aslan's face, they just caught a glimpse of the golden mane and the great, royal, solemn, overwhelming eyes. And then they found they couldn't look at him and went all trembly. Go on, whispered Mr. Beaver. No, whispered Peter, you first. Nope, sons of Adam before animals, whispered Mr. Beaver back again. Susan, whispered Peter, what about you? Ladies first. No, you're the eldest, whispered Susan. And of course, the longer they went on doing this, the more awkward they felt. Then at last, Peter realized that it was up to him. Okay. All right, we will stop there for today and we'll figure out what happens tomorrow when the children finally get to meet Aslan. Hope y'all are all having a great day and I will talk to you again next week.